In a word, it's chaos. You'll have to see it to believe it. Whoever said that must have been talking about Talladega. It's a place where chaos mixes with speed. Where a town turns into a city and a weekend becomes a lifetime of memories. It's a tradition like no other. What a wild finish. At a track like no other. And after it's all over, you still won't believe it ever happened. Get your tickets now at talladegasuperspeedway.com. Roll Tide and welcome to this Tuesday edition of Crimson Drive driven by NASCAR. This is Roger Hoover. Great to be with you again on a Tuesday for the first time this football season as we are in game week. So that means that Crimson Drive driven by NASCAR will now be twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central right back here on the CTSN Facebook page. But I'm glad you're with us as we have a really busy show coming up. We'll go through some of our headlines thanks to our friends at RJ Young. They are the official technology solution provider of Crimson Drive. First of all, on the show, as always, we'll hear from the head coach of the Crimson Tide, Nick Saban, with Coach's Checklist. Then we'll be catching up with Bryce Young as we're going to have one-on-one -on -one interviews with members of the Alabama football team all throughout the season here on Crimson Drive. And who better to start with than the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, quarterback Bryce Young. So that one-on-one -on -one conversation will be coming up, as well as Scott Gerard joining us from Utah State. He is the announcer for the Utah State Aggies. He'll give us all a breakdown of Utah State's first win against UConn this past Saturday and what we can expect from Utah State on this Saturday against Alabama. Then we'll wrap things up by talking with one of our legends of the week, Roy Upchurch, who along with Terrence Cody will be the honorary captains on Saturday at Bryant-Denny Stadium. So a great conversation as well coming up with Roy Upchurch reliving that great 2009 Iron Bowl. As we go through the headlines for today, again, starting with the football team, the Crimson Tide will be starting the season against Utah State, the reigning Mountain West champions coming up this Saturday at Bryant-Denny Stadium, 6.30 p.m. start time. Our coverage on the radio will begin at 3.30 across the network and on the Varsity Network app as well as we will have the booth cam all throughout that ball game coming up here on our Facebook page. This will be the third time Alabama has played Utah State. The last time you have to go back to 2005, so the first time in the Saban era that it's been Alabama against Utah State. Crimson Tide, 15-0 in openers in the Saban era. That certainly looks good. And also starting at Bryant-Denny Stadium has always been strong 20 years in a row Alabama has picked up a home opening victory so we love seeing that and hope it continues coming up this week the Alabama soccer team really grabbed headlines this past weekend here in Tuscaloosa thanks to the Thursday win against Southern Miss but after that victory, goals by Macy Clem, Aislinn Streisick against the Golden Eagles, it was a Sunday night showdown with Clemson, the team that Alabama defeated 1-0 last year in the first round of the NCAA tournament for Alabama's first ever win in the NCAA tournament. And you thought the Tigers would have revenge on their minds, but the Crimson Tide really dominated the match against 18th-ranked Clemson, picking up a 3-0 win as Riley Parker had a brace with a pair of goals. Jonna Paul scored her first goal as a member of the Crimson Tide as well in that 3-0 victory. Thanks to the two goals against Clemson and some really solid play overall, Riley Parker has been named the SEC Offensive Player of the Week. She, of course, missed all of last season with injuries, so for her to come back and pick up that honor is great to see early in the year. Finally, we take a look at Crimson Tide Volleyball. Last weekend, a 3-0 start at the Crimson Tide Invitational, the first wins of the Rashinda Reed era against McNeese, UTSA, and Southern Miss. They're going to spend a lot of time on the road coming up. Next up is a tournament in Houston, where they'll be taking on Oregon State, as well as the University of Houston, and then Central Arkansas. So good luck to the Crimson Tide coming up this weekend in Houston. But on this show, we're going to be talking football the rest of the way, and that begins with Coach's Checklist as we hear from the head coach of the Crimson Tide, Nick Saban, as game week is here, and the Crimson Tide are getting prepared for Saturday. At this time of the year, fall camp is always a grind, so there's always you know, a lot of anticipation, uh, a lot of energy and enthusiasm to you know, play the first game, and I think the focus for us needs to be on playing the best, setting a standard for you know, how we want to play, how we want to do things, how we want to finish plays, how we want to execute. You know, what is the identity of this team, you know, going to be? I think there's lessons learned from a year ago when we didn't prepare right, we didn't practice the way, you know, I think we need to practice to prepare. You know, we didn't always play really well. So to be a more consistent team in terms of our ability to prepare and execute, I think is going to be critical for you know, how we play not only in the opener, but how we progress throughout the season. 
Uh, Utah State, Blake Anderson has done a really good job there. This team can play, you know, really in any conference and do well. Um, they ended up a top 25 team a year ago. They won 11 games, beat, you know, a couple Pac-12 teams, um, beat Oregon State in the bowl game. And they've got like 12 starters back, um, quarterbacks back, who's a really good player. Uh, they were one of the most effective passing teams in the country a year ago. These guys are very aggressive on defense. They create a lot of negative plays. Uh, they get a lot of turnovers. Um, they've got their specialists back. So uh, they had a, a game. Obviously, you know that they beat uh, Connecticut last week, you know, 31 to 20 and got off to a little bit of a slow start, but then played really well, you know, as the game progressed. So, um, you know, this is really kind of about us and how we prepare to play and what we need to do against uh, a really good opponent. So uh, that's going to be the emphasis, emphasis, you know, all week long for us. I think, you know, we feel good about the running back position. There's experience there, even though two of the guys, two out of the first three guys or two out of the first four guys, however you want to couch it um, are coming off of injuries they don't seem to be having any issues or problems and have had really good fall camps uh, Jameer has you know been a, a really positive addition to the offense in terms of what he gives us so I think we have five guys there that can play winning football and we're going to continue to try to develop all those guys obviously based on what happened last year this is a, a position where it's good to have a lot of depth Cam's going to start practicing today, uh, see how he progresses and see how he does. I don't think anybody can, you know, make a prediction about that right now. He was on the, you know, treadmill and all that stuff last week, never had an issue, never had a problem. So, you know, the next thing he does is start, you know, dry land, working, doing individual, seeing what he can do in practice. And, you know, it's kind of day to day with him, but I think the good news is, is because we have three young players at that position, they have gotten a ton of reps and made significant progress because of the ton of reps that they've got in his absence. Um, so, you know, Robbie Oates has done a really good job at, at the position, but all three young guys have made significant progress and they'll probably, you know, have some role in this game. And that was Coach's Checklist with Coach Saban. We'll have that coming up as well for our Thursday edition at 2 o'clock here on Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR. Don't be the only one to miss out on the NASCAR Cup Series playoffs at Talladega Super Speedway. Witness the return of racing to Talladega on October 2nd and be a part of the best atmosphere in sports. Tickets are on sale now at talladegasuperspeedway.com. Secure your tickets today. If you can't make it to the race, tune in on NBC at 1 p.m. Central on October 2nd. As we welcome back to Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR, we're going to be having a special feature for you all throughout this football season on these Tuesday and Thursday shows. One-on-one -on -one interviews with players on the Crimson Tide football team. The first time we've had that as part of Crimson Drive here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. And this week, we're starting from a very strong spot on the Alabama roster as we were joined yesterday by quarterback Bryce Young, the reigning Heisman Trophy winner. He's back to lead the Crimson Tide this season. We had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him yesterday as we get set for week one against Utah State. First of all, Bryce, roll time to you. Glad it's finally game week. 100%. Yeah, obviously a lot of preparation is going into it. Uh, feels like a super long offseason, but for us now to finally start game playing and knowing that the games are on the corner, it's super exciting. What was your focus going into fall camp? What was most important for you the last few weeks? Yeah, I think we just had some new faces coming in, um, some people that are stepping up to, you know, new roles. So I think it was just us getting on the same page, us communicating, um, us kind of assimilating to those new roles and getting familiar with those faces and making sure that we're on the same page um, going into this uh, game and starting the season. Of course, uh, you have good chemistry with a lot of your wide receivers. Did a lot of that start back in seven-on-seven seven work? Yeah, 100 percent. I feel like, um, you know, the, the seven on sevens that we did in off season, uh, spring, all that stuff, just the more reps you can have, that's the more comfortable you're going to be with the guys that you're throwing to, um, the guys you're working with really on at any position. Um, so I think those reps along with, you know, the stuff leading up to the season starting, I think all that really plays in its part and I think it's really helping all of us. What can you tell us about the emergence of Kobe Prentice at wide receiver and what he's done well this fall camp? Yeah, Kobe's someone who's come in, work extremely hard. Um, he has great energy. Um, he, 
he's always that kind of that, that spark plug as soon as he walks in the room. Um, and, you know, I, I think we all kind of need that. And really just what he does on the field and athletically, I think it speaks for itself. But kind of the, the how humble he's came in and been, um, how, how much willingness he's had to learn. Um, I think that's the stuck that that's really stuck with me, stuck with the rest of the team. Uh, so I'm super excited for him, and, and I'm happy he's here. We know he got really comfortable throwing to Alabama's tight ends last season. Cam Latu starting to practice, so hopefully we'll get back him him soon. But uh, looking at other tight ends, who's really stepped up the last few weeks in Cam's absence? Yeah, um, I, I think Robbie's done a really good job. Um, he, he's come in. He, he's he's been kind of steady and stable this entire off season, uh, knowing what to do. Um, you know bringing that, that, that worker's mindset and making sure he's getting better each and every practice. Um, he's done a really good job um, stepping up, and um, also Miles. Miles Kissman's done a good job as well. Um, he, he's done, you know, he's he's new, he's learning, um, but he, he's done well. And then Jurassic is extremely talented. Um, he's going to have a really, really bright future. Um, you know, just you know, obviously new, learning how to how to figure everything out like we all are freshman year, but I'm excited to watch him develop as well. You got to see Utah State play UConn in week zero. What stood out to you about the Aggies on film? Yeah, they, they look like a really good unit. Um, you know, we knew that kind of watching film from last year, but, you know, obviously seeing them them last week, um, really well coached, really disciplined, a lot of playmakers. Um, they really fly to the ball. Um, they all know what, what what's going on. They all play their roles and, and play their positions extremely well. Um, so it's a well coached team, well coached unit, um, and it's going to be a, a, a big challenge for us. So um, we're excited. We know how good they are, so it's on us to put the work in. First time in 11 years Alabama started the season at home here in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> Brian Denny, are you guys excited to stay here in Tuscaloosa all week one? Yes, 100%. Um, you know, anytime we get to play in front of our fans, uh, that means a lot for us. The support that everyone brings in the stadium, um, just that energy, uh, that vibe means a lot to us. Um, so so, you know, we're, we're happy to be starting the year off here. Um, you know, anytime we get to be in Brian Denny, it, it's huge for us. So uh, I'm super excited as a team. We're all excited to play in front of everyone who, who comes out and supports. Look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Bryce, thank you for joining us. Best of luck against Utah State. Roll Tide. For sure. Roll Tide. You'll have to see it to believe. Whoever said that must have been talking about Talladega. It's a place where chaos mixes with speed, where a town turns into a city, and a weekend becomes a lifetime of memories. Get your tickets now at talladegasuperspeedway.com. Great to catch up with quarterback Bryce Young and just a preview coming up on Thursday's edition of Crimson Drive driven by NASCAR will be joined by Crimson Tide linebacker and who knows maybe a Heisman contender this year Will Anderson Jr. So look forward to that for our player one on one coming up on Thursday. Another weekly feature that we have for you on Crimson Drive driven by NASCAR all throughout the season is the other booth and in the other booth we talk to the play by play announcer or a member of the broadcast crew for the team that Alabama is playing in this week it's Utah State in week one and that means we're talking with Scott Gerard, the longtime voice of the Utah State Aggies and already he's been busy this season after the win that the Aggies had against UConn on Saturday so we hope you enjoyed the scouting report on Utah State courtesy of the voice of the Aggies Scott Gerard. a look at Alabama's opponent in week one but Scott we've already seen the Aggies play in week zero what can you tell us about the victory for Utah State against UConn this past Saturday yeah a little uh uh, a game that probably was a lot closer than I think Utah State fans would have liked. Uh, Aggies came in 27-point favorites against UConn, and and we're down 14 nothing like right out of the gate, and uh, came back and uh, outscored UConn 24 nothing in the second quarter. And then the second half, which just kind of played through things a little bit, ended up with an 11-point victory. Utah State, I don't think, showed their full display of what they're capable of. Really conservative game plan, kept things on the ground quite a bit. Uh, but I think that uh, most importantly, they came out healthy and uh, getting ready for what should be a really fun game against Alabama coming up this weekend. What helped lead to the turnaround after it was 14-0 UConn? What were the steps Utah State took after that? Well, UConn with Jim Mora, new coaching staff, they didn't really know what they were preparing for. Uh, and UConn threw a lot of things at them they weren't prepared for. And UConn's improved. I mean, they've added 25 players out of the transfer portal. So they're a much improved team. They were able to run the ball really well with kind of a zone blocking stretch running attack that Utah State wasn't really prepared for. And when the Aggies got to the sideline and kind of figured out what was going on, they were able to put the clamps on and get it done in the second half. They gave up over 150 yards rushing in the first quarter and only gave up 80 the rest of the game. And so once they got things dialed in, it was pretty business as usual. Utah State's a really good team uh, for a Mountain West Conference standards. They'll be in the running for a Mountain West Conference title again this year. Uh, they've got really good players with especially Logan Bonner coming back for another year. So this is a really talented team. And once they got things dialed in and figured things out, uh, they were able to handle UConn fairly easily. Yeah, let's talk for a minute about your quarterback, Logan Bonner. Obviously, a lot of success last season helping uh, Utah State win the Mountain West. But what does he do it when he's playing at his best? 
really fun player to watch. And this is a guy that came in. He's a gunslinger. I mean, he's from Texas, fits the mold. Uh, there's some throws that he'll make that kind of make you cringe a little bit, but he's going to take some chances and he's going to have some, he's, he's going to have some fun out there. But one thing about Logan Bonner, that's really been fun to watch is when the game's on the line, there's not a lot of other quarterbacks in the country that you feel comfortable with needing to take your team 75 yards and, and, and going and winning the game. Did it several times last year. Uh, he's got a lot of play. interesting thing about him. He did have a knee injury in that bowl game last year against Oregon state uh, that kept him out of spring uh, somewhat limited in fall. So He's not quite a hundred percent, but he's good enough to go. And and an eighty five percent Logan Bonner's is going to win a lot of games for Utah State this year. Who are some of his favorite targets? Whether that's wide receivers, tight ends, or even running backs coming out of the backfield, it seems like he can get the ball to them as well. Yeah, good question too. And that's one of the big concerns Utah State had going into the season. They had three guys that uh, last season had over three thousand yards uh, receiving. Uh, 31 touchdowns between the three of them. All three of them are gone. Two of them are still in NFL training camps right now. Uh, Devin Tompkins, uh, who had 1,700 yards receiving last year and 10 touchdowns, dynamic receiver. All those guys are gone. So they had to replenish their wide receiver core. They got, uh, you know, Xavier Williams from Alabama is on the team. Uh, they've got uh, Brian Cobbs from Maryland who transferred into the team. Uh, Kyle Van Leeuwen's another player to keep an eye on. Number nine uh, that's been with the team and finally getting an opportunity to expand his role with this team. So the offense is such that will allow wide receivers to be successful. This is a dynamic up-tempo offense. They like to spread the field. You'll see these wide receivers hugging that far sideline. They spread you out as much as they possibly can to use as much as the field as they possibly can. So it's a fun offense. It'll generate opportunities. It'll generate offense. And these wide receivers had a good week one um, and uh, week two should be interesting to watch as well. Looking at the defensive side of the ball, what's really the strength of this Aggie defense? They are all about speed at the line of scrimmage. They're not big. They're not overly strong at the line of scrimmage, but they are, uh, you know, they're one of the, they, you know, I, if not leading the nation last year, there were one or two, or there were two or three in terms of TFLs. They'd like to be aggressive and get downfield, get after the quarterback, make those dynamic plays at the line of scrimmage. Now, against big hulking offensive linemen like you're going to see against Alabama, like you'll see later in the year against BYU and Boise State. Some of these other teams, they will like to lean on that defensive line and try to get opportunities running the ball. Uh, but what their hope is, offensively, they're going to get some quick points, force the other team to throw the ball, then they can pin their ears back and get after the quarterback. They've got dynamic uh, pass rushers on with Byron Vons, Daniel Greshik, Pat, uh, Patrick Joyner. These are guys that really get after the quarterback. So they like to be disruptive. They like to disguise their blitzes. They are uber aggressive defensively. And sometimes it's risking. Sometimes it's a little bit of reward. But they're going to have a lot of fun doing it. And it's, uh, it's a fun defense to watch. And how about the secondary? It seemed like a couple of big interceptions against UConn helped that turnaround, especially in the first half. They really are. And uh, Gervin Hall's another guy from the University of Miami. And I'm going to rattle off, continue rattle off transfer portal, guys, because that's what Utah State did. I mean, two years ago, they were one in five in the COVID shortened year and were just in a bad spot. Blake Anderson comes in and really rejuvenates this roster through the transfer portal. They played it really well, and a lot of power five guys are on this team. So Gervin Hall in that defensive backfield, he's a guy that played at Miami. Uh, Hunter Reynolds was a guy that played at Michigan. Um, these are guys that have P5 experience that have come in and helped bolster this defensive backfield. They're smart. They're athletic. They make good plays. Uh, Johnny Carter's another guy to keep an eye on on the outside. Uh, they're bigger, longer defensive back. Uh, he's a ball hawk as well. So these are guys that like to make big plays and certainly have a big test uh, against them coming up this Saturday, but certainly uh, are up for the challenge uh, against uh, a good chunk of the teams are going to play this year. And what can you tell us about Blake Anderson and the job he was able to do last year? In this part of the country, we obviously knew the success he had at Arkansas State, winning the Sun Belt twice, but going to the Mountain West Conference with Utah State and winning that last year, just what can you tell us about the turnaround he was able to have in Logan a year ago? Really remarkable, and I don't think we can overstate enough of what he's meant to this uh, this institution because it was not in a good place uh, when uh, when he took over after the 2020 season. Uh, Gary Anderson who obviously is really beloved in Logan simply because in 2009, when he got the job the first time, he really turned that program around, then went to Wisconsin and Oregon State. Matt Wells took over for him and continued to win 10 games. They were nationally ranked. Jordan Love was a Matt Wells product that's now in the NFL with the Green Bay Packers. And then Gary Anderson came back 
uh, after Matt Wells left to go to Texas Tech, and things just didn't click. And then it with the COVID year and everything else, it just fell flat for a season. Uh, Gary Anderson was dismissed, and Blake Anderson came in with a really interesting urgency, but also a familiarity in terms of telling these players, look, I'm going to win you over. I'm your new coach. I understand I've got to re-recruit you to be a part of what we're doing here. And he really connected with these players. It was not an easy situation for him to walk into. Uh, and the players bought in. And to their credit, they bought in. He's a really personable guy. Uh, if you get a chance to chat with him, it'll be one of your favorite interviews. He's really fun to be around. Infectious personality. He's been through a lot of trials and issues in his life. And he's been able to overcome those. And guys understand that. They know he's spent through hell and back. If you read his backstory, uh, the guy has gone through things that nobody should have to go through in his life. But yet he's still the most positive person in the room, the most excited person in the room, and players feed off of that. And once they started to win last year and they bought in, and then it was like just that last year just steamrolled to an 11-win season and a Mountain West Conference title. And now, of course, uh, 1-0 getting ready to take on Alabama, preseason number one team in the country. Just, Scott, what's the mood around this program towards this game? What are some small victories that can be made for Utah State in this matchup with Alabama on Saturday? Cool. Well, I, I, I hosted the coaching show last night and I asked Blake Anderson the same thing. And he said, look, we just want to get better. That's our number one thing. If we go out there and we play our best game and we lose, all right, we, we hold our head up high and we say, all right, we played the best team on the planet with some of the best players on the planet. And, uh, and, and we, we, we swung and uh, did our best that we possibly could. He goes, that's all I want to see. I want to see improvement from week one to week two. I want to see our guys get better. And uh, we'll take the result, however it may be. Obviously, it's a tough task going into uh, Tuscaloosa and playing Alabama. This team realizes it. But they also understand that Utah State plays some of these games every year. I mean, the Aggies are, you know, a program that they need to play one of these, you know, so-called money games every year. And the players understand that. And they say, all right, you know what? If we're going to do this, then let's play the best. And I think there's a certain level of excitement. There's guys that are from the Southeast uh, that are on this team that, probably do have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. So they want to go out there and have some fun. I talked to Logan Bonner yesterday. He was part of the Arkansas State team that played there in 2018. Uh, and so he knows the environment. He knows what they're walking into. And his message to the team is, hey, let's just go out and have some fun. You know, what's the worst that's going to happen? We're going to beat. We're going to get beat by Alabama. All right. So let's just go out there, let it rip, have some fun, and, and see what happens. And I think this team is loose. Uh, they understand that obviously they'll probably have some big eyes when they walk into that stadium in front of a hundred thousand fans, but let's make it an enjoyable experience and, uh, and let some people, uh, see what we do out there at Utah state. And Scott, as we let you go, just what's the outlook for Utah state this season in the mountain West, trying to defend that title from a year ago. Uh, mountain West has improved air force is a really good team. Boise States, Boise state. So they'll continue to be a good team as well. And uh, there's some good teams around the conference, but I'd put Utah state up with anybody in that conference. Uh, these are games that you always get a little wary of Utah state played LSU and Joe Burrow and that team won the national championship back in 2019. And they came out of that really banged up and it really affected the rest of their season. So the thing that I'm going to look at personally, I know the coaches or players won't say this, but for me personally projecting what Utah state does the rest of the season, I'm going to look at injuries. If this team comes out of this game healthy, regardless of whatever the score is, if they come out healthy in this game, I'm going to feel pretty good about Utah state's chances to repeat. So my big thing is, uh, you know, get out of Alabama, make sure that check clears and then uh, make sure everybody stays healthy and, uh, and then get ready for what should be a fun 2022 season. That certainly sounds good. Well, Scott, uh, thank you for joining us here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Safe travels to Tuscaloosa this weekend, and we look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Rolled to, or Thank you for joining us. Fired up. Should be a lot of fun. Thanks to Scott Gerard of Utah State for joining us to give us a preview on the Aggies. Again, Alabama and Utah State coming up this Saturday, 6.30 p.m. inside Bryant-Denny Stadium. And our radio coverage, of course, will start at 3.30 coming up on Saturday all across the radio network, the Varsity Network app as well. As we get ready to wrap up this edition of Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR, we have another weekly segment that, again, we're going to have all throughout the season, whether it's home games or road games for the Crimson Tide, and that is a visit with an Alabama. 
Alabama legend as we always honor honorary captains for all home games and the two captains this week will be Terrence Cody as well as Roy Upchurch from the 2009 National Championship team coach Saban's first national championship team here at Alabama and we had a chance to catch up with Roy Upchurch who got the game winning touchdown against Auburn in the Iron Bowl in 2009 had a great Alabama career and we catch up with what he's been up to since then and some memories of his playing days at the Capstone. First of all, Roy, roll tide. It's great to see you. How's everything going? Roll tide. Everything's going well. Just really uh, putting a lot of time into developing student athletes and uh, just staying busy, to be honest with you. Well, we know that includes coming back here to campus uh, for the Utah State game as you and Terrence Cody are our captains, honorary captains for this ball game. Just what did it mean to you when you heard from Alabama inviting you back this weekend? Oh, man, when they mentioned TC, it was uh, I, I was ear to ear about it just because that's a good friend of mine. And, you know, just the experience he had in 2009 with the Rocky Block and my catch as well, you know, just bringing that moment for both of us together. It's, it's I couldn't ask for anything better. Well, we look forward to having you back in Tuscaloosa, a place where you had a really great career for the Crimson Tide, uh, culminating in that national championship season. But let's go back a little bit to your high school days. Uh, when you're being recruited, what stood out about Alabama? Why'd you sign with the Crimson Tide? Well, I just really liked the attention that they gave me. Uh, Bob Conley was my recruiter. Uh, Mike Shula was my head coach. And, you know, they were there every Friday night. They were under the lights watching my every move and all the runs I had. And so, uh, you know, that was something that really I considered uh, just because, you know, I like the attention of it. And, and I was nationally recruited, but uh, they just had to find a spot in the stands. And every Friday night they were there. And, um, you know, that's what really uh, allowed us to create a bond together, to be honest with you. And for you as well, Coach Saban comes in after Coach Shula. What was that adjustment like uh, getting to know him and the new staff and how'd they help your game once they arrived in Tuscaloosa? Oh, wow. Just the championship mentality. You know, uh, at first I didn't get it, but at the same time, everybody else had to learn it. And uh, once I picked it up and adjusted to my game, you know, I excelled and I excelled others. I helped others excel. And so um, Coach Saban is a, is a championship caliber coach and, you know, you have to honor that as a player. And if you don't, then you're just going to get washed out. Your time there is going to be up and and you might not get your opportunity. And I'm just uh, happy and proud that Coach Saban gave me the opportunity and never gave up on me uh, just to continue to vamp up my career and make the best out of my opportunity. And for you as well, you got to be in a running back room with a lot of talented guys. Uh, Glenn Coffey comes to mind. Then you look to the 09 season with Mark Ingram and Trent Richardson. Just what did it mean to have such talented teammates all around you at the time? Well, it was just a room full of talent and nobody could take a day off. Nobody could take a rep off. And those guys, we pushed each other to the brink of, you know, you have to step in and emerge as a starter. And if you don't bring that to the table every single day, then, like I said earlier, you might just get lost in the wash. Um, you know, freshmen like Eddie Lacy were in my room. Um, you know, guys like that that had game, but they just had to wait their turn. And if, uh, if you miss the beat, then the next man's up and, you know, it might get more playing time than you. But, you know, just having that room full of people, we kept each other encouraged and we kept um, we kept the ground alive. Burton Burns kept everybody in the fire, kept everybody ready on assignments and everything like that. And, uh, you know, we just the next man up and we was ready to go every week. How key was Burton Burns to the success you guys had and just Alabama football in general with the contributions oh, man, he's made he, to the Crimson Tide? Uh, well, he just made football so easy. You know, it sometimes it could be algebra, but he made it to where it was uh, addition. One plus one is two. You know, you make the right read here or do a jump cut there. And he just made it so easy for us. And, you know, that type of coaching allowed a lot of people to have a whole lot of success. And, um, you know, I, I, I just give him a lot of credit just for the dedication that he's put into us and the career and all the running backs that he's allowed to become uh, legendary and elite. Um, and the list goes on of guys he, he's worked with. So, um, you know, Burton did a great job for us. Well, you mentioned the word legendary, and to become a Crimson Tide legend, you got to have a big moment against a key rival, and especially in the Iron Bowl, and you're able to have that, catching the game-winning touchdown in 2009 down on the plays, ju planes. Just First of all, what can you tell us about the drive leading up to that play that culminated in the uh, touchdown scoring drive? Well, uh, 
uh, Matt, uh, McElroy and Julio had a great series. You know, they connected, they dinked and donked them all the way down the field. Uh, Mark was banged up that game. And so me and Trent had to do all we can just to make the backfield uh, not miss a beat. And so, um, you know, like I said, Mark and uh, uh, Mac and Julio did a great job just making play after play, play after play, play after play. The offensive line play was good. Um, and everybody was just on point, and my play was just the icing on the cake. It was something that we practiced all year long, and that just happened to be a moment where we called it. And that one time we called that play, one time that whole year, and it was just a success. And so uh, credit goes to Coach, um, and, and the rest is history. Yeah, we read uh, that Greg McElroy even said when they told you during the timeout, because Coach Saban called timeout to make sure they got this play in, that when they told you you were getting the ball, you kind of like, yeah, I got you. Was that kind of your mindset? Were you just staying in the moment during that timeout, knowing that the ball was coming to you? Well, I really knew that um, it was a moment that I really had to just center in on the play call and just make sure I got everybody uh, attention to know that, you know, I'm coming in, everybody needs to do what they need to do. And, uh, you know, I was excited, but at the same time, you know, it's it's what we do. It's, it's what we do. We're used to doing it. Uh, like I said, Coach Saban demands perfection. So when your numbers call, you have to perform. And you certainly did again, catching the game winning touchdown in the Iron Bowl. After that, you beat Florida in the SEC championship. After that, we go out west to the Rose Bowl, a win over Texas for Alabama's first national championship since 1992. And for you to wrap up your Alabama career like that, what did it mean to you being at the first championship team under Coach Saban here in Alabama? Well, it meant a lot just because uh, a lot of guys, uh, the year before, we felt like we were supposed to win a national championship. Um, but we felt like we got snubbed with Dante's uh, pass interference call. Um, so we wore that leading up until the next year. Um, and, you know, we worked hard. We made sure, you know, everybody did what they were supposed to do each game. And um, it just meant a lot, just that accomplishment, because every person that signs that letter of intent, you know, wants to uphold a national championship. And everybody that wants to come to Alabama, that's the standard. And so... Um, it just meant a lot because it was one of the things that I checked off as far as uh, the things I wanted to get accomplished in college as well as graduating. Um, and, and we made it happen. You know, it was a collective team uh, mindset all year long and, and we got it. So, and the rest is history. And, and now that's the template, to be honest with you. It really is. And a few years ago, we had you guys back in town for the 10th anniversary of the championship. Now it's been 13 years since that championship. Does yeah. it feel like it's been that long? Oh, uh, time's flying by. So it, it really does. But, um, you know, there's a lot of history that's going on right now. And Alabama is the place to be. Uh, and Coach Saban, you know, he's the he's a trademark of college football right now. And, and just that uh, caliber football that we bring here to Alabama is what everybody expects. And um, like I said, the rest is history. It really is. And uh, Roy, before we let you go, what can you tell the fans about what you've been up to since your playing days ended? Well, since my playing days in, um, I've become a husband, a father of three, and um, I aspire to become a division one football coach in the future. I've been coaching running backs. i Won a national championship at Florida State and uh, with Jameis Winston and that whole crew. Um, I've helped some kids go to college at IMG Academy. Uh, I've also um, went to Georgia Military College and helped a group of running backs, help them accomplish their dream as well. And so that's my thing. And right now I'm just teaching right now here in Jefferson County and just, um, just really giving everybody a dose of leadership and uh, just helping everybody accomplish their dream, to be honest with you. We're certainly proud of the hard work you're doing there. And uh, Roy Upchurch, just thank you so much for joining us here on Crimson Drive and the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Can't wait to have you and Mount Cody side by side being recognized on Saturday inside Bryant Denny Stadium. But thank you for your time. Roll Tide. Thank you for having me. Roll Tide. What a great player in Alabama football history, Roy Upchurch. Again, he and Terrence Cody will be our honorary captains this week for Alabama against Utah State. Make sure you give them a rousing standing ovation coming up this Saturday at Bryant-Denny Stadium. As we start to look forward to the weekend, it's time for the Wickles Weekend Update. Of course, brought to you by Wickles Pickles, Wickles Pickles, wickedly delicious. 
And we'll take a look at what is coming up across the Crimson Tide Sports Network over the next few days. It certainly will be busy. Coming up on Thursday, we'll once again have another edition of Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR, coming your way at 2 p.m. right back here on the CTSN Facebook, Twitter, and, of course, archived on YouTube as well. Then later that evening, it'll be Hey Coach and the Nick Saban Show, 6.30 p.m. from Baumhauer's Victory Grill in Tuscaloosa. Chris Stewart will be your host, and he'll be joined at the restaurant by Crimson Tide head coach Nick Saban for the first time this season so we're really excited about Thursday getting here and then on Saturday we will have Alabama against Utah State 6 30 from Brian Denny Stadium radio coverage will start at 3 30 don't forget as well the booth cam right back here on the CTSN Facebook page then Sunday we will have the Nick Saban television show as Chris Stewart and Coach Saban will recap the Utah State game and there's another edition as well of Tide TV this week that's also on YouTube as well and then Monday night even though it is Labor Day we will have an edition of Crimson Tide Rewind coming up 6 p.m. from Baumhauer's Victory Grill in Vestavia Hills in the Birmingham area. So I'll be joined by Corey Reamer for that show to take a look back at Crimson Tide against Utah State and We'll even start talking about Alabama against Texas on that show. Yes, the Week 2 matchup in Austin is looming, but first things first, we stick to the process around here, and we're focused on Utah State. Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR, also focused on the NASCAR Cup Series playoffs. They are returning to Talladega on October 2nd, and you don't want to miss it. Purchase your tickets today for the NASCAR Cup Series playoff race at talladegasuperspeedway.com. This is going to wrap up this edition of Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR on this Tuesday afternoon. Don't forget, we'll be back coming up at 2 p.m. for Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR as well, right back here on the CTSN Facebook page. Huge thank you to our guests today, including Bryce Young, the quarterback for the Crimson Tide, along with Scott Gerrard, the voice of Utah State, as well as Alabama legend Roy Upchurch. And thanks as well to Ethan Carabin for producing this show. Thanks to our friends at Wickles Pickles, of course. Check them out at wickles.com. And again, thanks to NASCAR as NASCAR is coming back to Talladega on October 2nd. We look forward to that and we look forward to Crimson Tide football at the end of the week. Till Thursday with the 2 o'clock edition of Crimson Drive driven by NASCAR. This is Roger Hoover signing off. Thanks for watching the Crimson Tide Sports Network.